Out of the box, the Steam Deck does a great job at letting you download and play compatible games whenever and wherever you want. However, to get the most out of it, the Steam Deck requires a bit of tinkering. And while this can be a bit intimidating, this is also what makes the deck so exciting. Because once you get your bearings, you can make the deck do all kinds of amazing things that you couldn't even dream of doing on any other handheld or console. In this video, I'll be going through everything you need to know to do that tinkering, from setting frame rate limits to using custom Proton versions and programs that you need to have on your deck. There's a lot to cover. First of all though, if this video is helpful to you, go ahead and subscribe and send the video to someone you know with a deck to help them out too. I'll be covering a lot of different topics in this video, so if you want to skip to a specific topic, use the timestamps down below to get right to what you need to learn. First up, I want to talk about how you do some of the more common and general configuration within the gaming mode on the Steam Deck. If you're using a micro SD card with your Steam Deck, you might have noticed something a little unusual. When you go to install a game and get past this screen, it just goes ahead and starts downloading without prompting you for where you want to actually install the game. So you might be wondering, well, how do I actually get these games on my SD card if it's not going to prompt me? Well, what you have to actually do is set a default install path for your Steam Deck to tell it where you want to install your games. The way to do this is you go to settings and then you go to storage all the way down here. And you'll notice that when you hover over one of the places you can install a game, the X button will set it to make it the default. So you can X on the drive to make the internal drive your default, or you can hit X on the micro SD card. Whichever one you have set as the default, that is where the Steam Deck will be downloading your games. The next setting you should know how to change is the fan curve. When the Steam Deck first came out, a lot of reviewers complained that the fan could get quite noisy. And Valve listened and implemented a new fan curve that was quieter. However, this new fan curve also means the fan's not spinning as fast. So while it is quieter, your Steam Deck could actually get a bit hotter. If you don't like this new default fan curve, perhaps because you've noticed your deck getting a little bit hot when playing some intense games for long periods of time, Valve has given you the setting in order to switch back to that original fan curve. The way you do it is you go into the settings and you go to system and you scroll all the way to the bottom past all this information. And down here, there's a setting, enable updated fan control. Simply toggle this off and your fan will ramp up to much higher speeds. This will make the fan louder. However, it will also make your Steam Deck significantly cooler when playing demanding titles. Next up, you'll need to know how you change your settings for control and Steam input. This is pretty simple. On any game page, you'll notice over here on the right, there is a button with a little controller icon. Just hit it and it'll bring up this UI which lets you either pick an existing layout to use or customize a layout. If you go up here, you can pick from both the recommended layout, generic templates for a number of items, or ones that the community have made specifically for this game, and then shared online for other people to download. You might find that there's some really good community layouts out there for playing games on the Steam Deck, especially for games that don't have built-in controller support. A lot of people have taken the time to create custom profiles for controllers or for the Steam Deck for games that don't actually have gamepad support, and by going here and downloading a community layout, you can find something that makes even non-controller games run really well on the Steam Deck. The next topic is perhaps the most important one in this entire video, and that is how you change the Proton version for a game. Now, without getting too technical, Proton is the compatibility layer that the deck uses in order to have Windows games be able to run on Linux. Now, because these games were designed to run under Windows and not under Linux or specifically on the Steam Deck, there can be technical issues translating Windows over to Linux. And as a result, you might find yourself needing to change which version of Proton you are running because one might have better compatibility with a game than another, or even use a custom Proton version supplied by someone other than Valve. The way you do this is you go over here and click this little gear icon to bring up the settings. Then go to Properties, and under Compatibility, you get the option force the use of a st specific Steam Play compatibility tool. Now, by default, this will be set to whatever the most recent version of Proton is. However, you can go through this list and pick 
any specific version you want, or even Proton Experimental, which is the most recent beta version, or like I've done, use GE Proton, which I'll tell you how to install later on in this video, which is a custom third-party Proton solution, which has additional support for a number of games. For example, if you look here, Fall Guys is actually unsupported by the Steam Deck. According to Valve, it will not run, and they are correct in saying so. If you download Fall Guys on your Steam Deck and try to just run it normally, it will not work. However, if you use GE Proton, the game boots up and runs just fine. So having GE Proton set up on your deck and knowing how to change between different versions of Proton is crucial to making sure you get the best possible experience playing games on your deck. Next, let's talk about the most important button on the Steam Deck and one you're gonna be using quite a bit, which is this one right here with the three dots on it. This is called the Quick Access button. When you push it, it brings up this menu with quick settings with lots of little things for you to change. For instance, you can change the brightness of the screen, the audio level really quickly. You can just turn things up and down in order to change volume. Uh, you have your microphone level settings as well as, you know, things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, etc. You can see I have some Bluetooth devices here and some other miscellaneous settings. While these quick settings are helpful, this is not what you're going to be using this for most of the time. Rather, you're going to come down here to the performance tab. This has a lot of really powerful tools for you. Now, when you first pull it up, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna be set to the basic view. But what you can do is you hit advanced view to get all these detailed information. First of all, you have the performance overlay. This lets you get a live readout of what, what frame rate you're getting of the current game you're playing. This first setting just gets you a simple number in the top left corner of what your current frame rate is. Set a little higher, you can get a lot more detailed information about your frame rate. You can even go crazy and set it up to three, or way, way overboard and get everything a tinkerer could ever possibly want to know. Now, this is a bit much to me. So for now, I'm just gonna set it down to two while I continue to talk about some of the other cool settings you have available to you here. Right here, you'll see the setting use per game profile. Now, if you're gonna customize anything in this menu, you probably want to turn this on. What this does is it lets you set custom settings per game. So for instance, you can set a custom frame rate cap specifically for Final Fantasy XIV and then a different frame rate cap for a different game. This allows you to tailor your experience for each game for the sort of performance, visual quality level, and battery life that you want to get out of that particular game. So the big option you have to set is your refresh rate and your frame rate. So by default, it'll be set to 60, which will run the game at an uncapped frame rate. You can see that playing Final Fantasy XIV in this rather busy area, I can't quite hit 60. I'm only hitting about 50 FPS. Now, this is less than ideal, as when you're getting 50 FPS on a 60 Hz refresh display, it doesn't look so hot. So, something you could do is simply lower this frame rate to 30. You can see it immediately updates with the new cap of 30 FPS, and I can just close, hit the button to close the quick access menu and go back to running around the game and now I have a silky smooth 30 FPS. Well, silky smooth is a bit of an overstatement, isn't it? As we all know, 30 FPS is kind of less than ideal. It ends up looking a bit choppy, at least to my eyes. But if you look in the top left, you can see that our battery life has greatly improved by locking the FPS at 30. So if you're going to be away from a charger for a while and want to play a game quite a bit longer, you can just open up this menu, slap a 30 FPS cap on there, and be in business. Personally, I think 30 FPS is a bit low, but as you could see, we really weren't quite hitting 60. So what can we do? Well, if you set something between 30 and 60, it just looks bad because that doesn't evenly divide into the 60 Hertz refresh rate. But if we open up that quick access menu again, you can see that just below frame rate limit is the setting for a refresh rate. This lets you actually lower the refresh rate of the screen in the Steam Deck. That way you can set the game to run at that frame rate, some frame rate below 60, and still have it look really good because it'll still be matching one-to-one -one with the refresh rate of the display. So what I like to recommend is cranking this refresh rate all the way down to 40. Now, as you can see, by setting the refresh rate to 40, it actually changed my settings for frame rate limit to be ones that are evenly divisible into 40. So I can just go up here to frame rate limit, set it to 40, 
and voila. Now I have a 40 FPS cap, which is significantly smoother than 30. In fact, it might be a bit counterintuitive, but 40 FPS is actually halfway between 30 and 60 as far as frame time goes. So 40 FPS I actually find is a great compromise between 30 and 60, both for visual quality and also getting an extra little bit of battery life out of your game. If the game you're playing can't quite hit 60 FPS, or if the battery life is a bit lower than what you would want, you should try setting the refresh rate to 40 and the frame rate cap to 40 and see how much better the battery life or performance is then. Now past those settings, there's a couple extra settings in here. Half rate shading will run the game at effectively a lower resolution. I do not recommend this setting because as you can see, it kind of makes the game look terrible and the performance and battery life savings are very minimal. So this is not something that I would ever use. These next two settings though, let you manually set the total device power or the speed that the clock runs at. Now, these are much more advanced settings. And for an advanced game like Final Fantasy XIV, there's really not a lot to dial in here. However, if you're running a really old game or something on an emulator that doesn't need a lot of power, you can come in here and crank these settings way, way down. And for doing that, you can get some serious battery life out of older games. We're talking five, six plus hours. For the most part, I recommend just leave these settings off. If you don't know what you're doing with those, just don't touch them. Down here, we have the scaling filter. This is for when you're running games at a lower resolution than the deck screen. You're telling it how you want to scale it up. Now, this game's running at actual native resolution, so this won't do anything. You have a couple options here. So linear will just scale it up linearly. It'll look kind of blurry. Uh, integer will keep it at the exact resolution. So if it's running at a lower resolution, it'll just have black bars around it. You also have nearest neighbor scaling and FSR, which are simply a different way of scaling things up. If you are playing a really like brand new game like Elden Ring or Doom or something that's really gonna push the Steam Deck to the limit, this gives you the option of running it at a resolution below the deck's native resolution and then scaling it up to try and hit something like a smooth 60 FPS or get better battery life out of it. This will degrade the image quality quite a bit. However, if that's not a big deal for you, especially when you're looking at it on the small seven inch screen of the deck, this is a great way to eke out some more performance. This covers a lot of the configuration you can do from inside gaming mode. To do more advanced things, you'll have to switch over to desktop mode, which you can do by hitting the Steam button, going down to power and selecting switch to desktop. After a short wait, it'll boot up into desktop mode. Now, once in desktop mode, you'll find this looks like, well, like the desktop of a PC. You're probably unfamiliar with Linux as I was when first hitting the Steam Deck. However, it works very similarly to both Mac OS and Windows. So if you're familiar with using any sort of desktop PC, you'll feel right at home here. First though, let's talk a bit about controls while in desktop mode. By default, the way it works is the right trackpad will move the mouse around. Pushing in the right trackpad will left click. And pushing in the left trackpad will right click. Now, it should be noted that there is a weird quirk with the controls in desktop mode on the Steam Deck, where this is only how the controls work while Steam is running. If you close out of the Steam application for whatever reason, what will happen is, for a moment, the controls will stop responding and will go completely dead. And then after a couple of seconds, you'll get controls back. However, the controls will now be different. Pushing in on the touch pads will do absolutely nothing. Rather, you have to use the triggers for left click and right click, with the left trigger being right click and the right trigger being left click. Now, this is just a weird quirk of how this was programmed, but if you start Steam back up, it'll go back to the original controls. Now, because the Steam Deck is technically a Linux PC, it does support external keyboards and mice. For the duration of this video, I'll be using a Bluetooth mouse and a Bluetooth keyboard in order to make things easier and faster for me. If you have either a Bluetooth mouse and keyboard of your own, or you have a USB-A to USB-C cable, which will let you plug a regular keyboard and mouse into your Steam Deck, 
You might find that very convenient if you're going to be spending any time customizing and tweaking things in desktop mode. However, if you don't, one thing you should know is how to manually invoke the keyboard. The way you do it is by holding the Steam button and hitting X. This will pop up a virtual keyboard that you can then type on with your fingers. So, why boot up into desktop mode? Well, first of all, you can install apps this way outside of Steam through the Discover Store. The Discover Store is, you can think of it sort of like an app store on your phone. It's a third-party downloader that comes pre-installed on the Steam Deck for you to download free software. This is what you'll be using to download and update non-Steam applications, such as Firefox. Now, there are a couple of important applications that you ought to download and install on your Steam Deck. First of all is one called G-Edit. What G-Edit is, is it's a simple application for editing text files. You might have use of this if you need to, say, edit a config file for a game in order to change some settings that aren't available in game. And while the Steam Deck does come with a text editor by default, the one it comes with by default is unusable by mere mortals. Gedit is a lot simpler, so you simply search for it in the search bar. You'll go over here, and I have it already installed, so it says removed, but you'll see install, and you'll just click install, and it will download and install it for you. The next program you should get is one that's very important. It's the one that lets you install custom versions of Proton in order to have better compatibility with games. It's called Proton Up QT. So simply type that in the search bar and it will show up over here and then click install. Once you have it installed, you should start it up and install the most recent version of Proton GE. You can find it here in applications. Proton Up QT, there you go. It'll start up in this little window and for you by default, it will have nothing under installed compatibility tools. What you're gonna to wanna to do is click add a version, select Proton GE, and then it should auto select the most recent version available. And then simply click install. This will download the most recent version of Proton GE onto your deck. And once done doing this, you'll simply be able to select it from that dropdown I showed you earlier when in gaming mode. If you are having trouble running a game on Steam Deck, I recommend that the first thing you do is come back to desktop mode, grab the most recent version of Proton GE, and then try using that instead of the default Steam one, because that could clear out a lot of issues. You can also, if you have older versions that are unused, you can come in here to delete them off of your deck. You're probably gonna to wanna to do this instead of letting them sit around because each version of Proton does take up about one and a quarter gigabytes of space on your Steam Deck. Next up, I wanna talk a little bit about the file browser for the Steam Deck. So this is a PC and you can access all the files just like you could on your computer. The file browser is called Dolphin. You can access it right down here. It'll be on the bar by default. Some things you need to do as soon as you open this up is first of all, you want to show hidden files. A lot of the stuff is hidden by default, including very important directories we're gonna talk about in a bit. So you're gonna have to show them in order to define where they're at. The first thing you might be wondering is, hey, wait a second, where's my SD card? So it's not super obvious looking here, but it's under removable devices and this is the SD card, but where's it located? It's located here in run slash the root directory slash run slash media slash this insane name. This is the location of your, of your SD card and you can always find it by simply scrolling down to the end here on the bottom. Now there's some other important folders that you need to know where they are that are not bookmarked by default. I have them bookmarked and you're probably gonna to want to do so too. The first one is the Steam folder. This contains a number of important folders and is located at root slash home slash deck slash dot local slash share slash Steam. Within Steam, there is the Steam Apps folder, and this contains two very important folders, Compact Data and Shader Cache. So I'd like to take a moment to talk about both of these. Compact Data is crucially important, and you might wanna open this and you might wanna bookmark this as well. In order to bookmark things, you simply go add entry and then you'll copy paste the address over here in order to make a bookmark. So in the Compact Data folder, you open it up and it looks like a bunch of gibberish, right? There's just these files with numbers on them. What's all this about? Well, 
Each game has its own compat data folder, and these numbers correlate to the Steam ID for that game. You can actually look up what a Steam ID is by using a website called SteamDB and typing in the name of the game you want to look up. Within this folder for each game, we'll open up uh, this one. You'll find this prefix folder and then it's something called Drive C. Within Drive C, you'll find an entire dummy Windows directory. This Windows directory is the only thing that the game sees when it's running because it thinks it's running under Windows. So if a game has any, you know, config files, you know, text files you have to edit, if it saves screenshots, if it's loading, looking the files to run mods or anything like that, it will be within the compact data folder for that game. And you would find it by finding that game's compact data folder, navigating to drive C, and then finding the spot where it would normally have that file on a Windows computer. So if you're following a guide online, it says something like, oh, the config file is, you know, C slash users slash your username, and then my documents, and then my games, and there's some, you know, game folder in there, and then within there is a config file, that's where you'll find it on the Steam Deck. So this is very crucial for actually being able to do some of those more PC game type things where you're going in and messing with config files or installing mods or things of that nature. The other folder I said was important is the shader cache. So the Steam Deck will actually preload shaders for games. This makes them run without stutters on the Steam Deck for the most part and is very helpful, except the shader caches tend to take up quite a bit of space. And as of the time of recording, the deck doesn't do a very good job of deleting these shader caches when it's done with them. And I believe it actually keeps them even if you uninstall the game. So if you have a 64 gigabyte model like I do, these shader caches can get a bit bloated and take up some space. So knowing where this folder is and what it's about is very important if you find yourself running out of space and you don't quite know why. It says it's under other in the storage category and you're like, well, I don't have games with taking all this space. It's probably shader caches and you can go in here and just delete some folders for games you don't have installed anymore in order to clean up that space. Next up, I want to talk about adding a non-Steam game to Steam. So you might find yourself for one reason or another wanting to play a game that isn't on Steam. Or you might find yourself wanting to add a, an application such as Firefox to Steam so that you can open it up from within gaming mode. How do you do that? Well, you can only do that in desktop mode and you do it the exact same way you would do it under Windows. You simply open up Steam and when you open up from within desktop mode, you'll find that it uses the same UI that it does on a desktop. You just go down here to add a game, add a non-Steam game, and you'll just navigate to the program from with browse or you'll simply find it in the list and click add. So for this example, I am going to add uh, We'll add whatever emoji selector is. We're gonna add that program. And once you've done that, you're done. You'll find in your library, emoji selector has been added. And once you've added it this way, you'll be able to boot it up from within gaming mode without having to come back to the desktop mode. The last program that I wanna talk about is Warpinator. This is how I move files over easily from my computer to my Steam Deck and vice versa. Like everything else, you can just install it through the Discover Store. And once you have it, all you have to do is start it up and you can simply drag files onto it on one computer in order to move it over to another computer. The Windows version of this app is actually called Winpinator because it's on Windows, but you simply just have to install it on multiple computers. And then when they're on the same network, you can simply drag and drop in order to move files over. I find this a lot easier for me than taking the SD card out of my Steam Deck and putting it into my computer. This lets me just do it without having to move things around. I just copy things over the Wi-Fi network. So if you're looking to copy some things over onto your Steam Deck, say some ROMs or save files or things like that, this is a great way to do it. Now, when you're done with desktop mode and you want to return to gaming mode, you'll find an icon on your desktop appropriately titled Return to Gaming Mode. Simply select this and your Steam Deck will switch over back to gaming mode. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about troubleshooting some issues on the Steam Deck. As much as I love this device, it is very new. It's trying to do something a bit crazy. And as you've probably heard from the reviews, there's a bit of jank involved. 
And sometimes things just won't work right. Maybe a game that worked yesterday just fine will just refuse to boot or controls will stop being responsive. What do you do when you have these random issues crop up? Well, the first thing you should do, and I'm sure you've heard this a million times before, is turn it off and on again. The vast majority of the time I've had issues with the Steam Deck, a simple restart just immediately fixed the issue. The next thing to try is if you're having issues with the game is you should try a different Proton version. You can simply select a different one from the ones Valve makes available to you, or you can switch to using the most recent GE Proton version or any GE Proton version, or perhaps you can even look online to see what people have suggested for GE Proton versions they've used that have worked just fine for them. The next thing you should check if you're having issues is to verify the game files. The way you do that is you go down here to properties and local files, and you'll see this option for verify integrity of game files. This will cause Steam to scan all the files for the entire game and see if something went wrong, something you know got corrupted, some file went missing, and there's any files that are incorrect, it will re-download those files and try to fix the install of your game. If all that fails and it's still not working for you, then the last step you have to try is to simply fully uninstall and reinstall the game. As unfortunate as it is, I've had people following some of my guides for how to get specific games running on the Steam Deck and it just wasn't working, they were having trouble, and the only thing that fixed it for them was to just do a full uninstall and full reinstall of the game and that got it working. I know it's a bit of a pain, but sometimes that's just what you gotta do. Now, as a bonus troubleshooting tip, I wanna talk about what do you do if you somehow manage to brick your deck? Well, you're not completely out of luck. Valve has an image for the SteamOS available on their website. And what you have to do is you simply have to image this onto a USB drive and connect that USB drive to your Steam Deck via a USB-C to USB-A adapter. And you can use that image in order to completely factory restore your Steam Deck. Now, if you've done something short of bricking the Steam Deck, you also have an option in the deck itself to restart it. Uh, within settings, there's a reset to factory state option that you can use within the system settings. Most likely, if your Steam Deck is still working, you won't have to use this. I haven't had to do any sort of factory reset or anything like that, but since it is still early days, even seven months in, you might accidentally have huge problems with your Steam Deck and a factory reset might be necessary, so it's good to know that this option is available to you. Lastly, I want to cover a few bonus tips, which don't really fit into this sort of category, but are really things you want to know. First of all, the Steam Deck has a lot of shortcuts for a number of things. For instance, holding the Steam button and hitting R1 will take a screenshot, which you can then upload to Steam or share in any number of ways. Now, there's a whole bunch of these shortcuts, but you don't have to have them memorized. You can pull up a list of all of these shortcuts by holding the Steam button and simply holding it in for a couple seconds, and it'll pop up this window with all of the shortcuts. Now, you can see there's a lot of useful stuff here, like force game shutdown or hitting the escape key, which are both useful for getting out of games if something's gone wrong and something's crashed. The other thing I wanna talk about is changing the controller order. Now, if you're trying to do something where you're playing the deck either in docked mode or in tabletop mode, you have it up on a stand, which I have and quite enjoy, then you might connect an external controller to the Steam Deck. And it has support for pretty much every controller out there, including the Xbox and PlayStation controllers. So there's no reason not to. However, you might run into some issues sometimes where the way the Steam Deck reports controllers is that it reports its inbuilt controller, the one that's built into the system, as controller one. And any other controllers that it has hooked up over Bluetooth, it will report as controllers two, three, four, etc. This can be a bit of a problem with some PC games because not all PC games are programmed with support for multiple controllers connected at once because that's usually not a thing that a lot of people do on PC. Not only that, but you might want to change the controller order around because, well, what if you want your controllers to be players one and players two, right? So if you want to change the controller order in a game you're playing, what you do is you hit the quick access menu button while you have the controller connected, and you'll see this additional button, rearrange controller order. You simply hit this up and you can rearrange the controllers to be in whatever order you want. So I've changed it now so my Xbox One controller over Bluetooth will be player one, whereas the Steam Deck itself will be player two. This lets you arrange the controllers in the order you want for say multiplayer games, or to make sure that the controller that you want to be player one is player one for games that only actually support one controller. 
Hopefully this video helps you get started tinkering with your Steam Deck and gives you all the tools and programs and knowledge you need in order to do so. I'm planning on making a whole bunch more Steam Deck videos in the future, so if you found this helpful, go ahead and subscribe, hit the like button so you don't miss out on them. And if you have any questions about something that I cover in this video, or thoughts on something you'd like to see me cover in an upcoming video, go ahead and leave a comment. Your comments have been super helpful in helping me figure out what sort of content you want to see in the future, so I'm really looking forward to hear what you guys have to say. And if you have a friend, perhaps, who has a Steam Deck, send this video to them so we can help them out as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.